and all. Uh, it's a great privilege and honor for Tracy to have you all with us this evening. And uh, I greet you all from Tracy in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this evening we are here to celebrate God's faithfulness, especially uh, in the life of Reverend Dr. John Stott, a great man of God who served uh, in the last century as well as in the first decade of this century. So as part of Tracy lecture, the Lord has enabled us to assemble together through this Zoom platform. And uh, uh, it is really, we are so happy to have all of you. And we welcome each one of you this evening, all the friends of Tracy, well-wishers of Tracy, supporters, prayer partners, and uh, regular participants of Tracy programs, and also the participants of Faith and Active Citizenship Training Program, which is the uh, Tracy's second online uh, course, which is going on now for these three months. So this is the fourth week. And uh, this lecture is uh, part of their uh, syllabus also. But it is open to everyone, everyone else. So I welcome each one of you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, I think, uh, I don't think... Uh, uh, Anyone needs an introduction to Tracy, but in case if there are, I think there are some new friends from Malaysia and so on, uh, attending or participating first time in a Tracy's program. Tracy is Theological Research and Communication Institute uh, in India, established in 1972. And uh, our mission is facilitating integrated response and transformative engagements through theological reflections on contemporary and relevant issues by communities of followers of Jesus Christ. So all our programs are geared to achieve this mission and the vision the Lord has given us. And the Tracy's lecture, annual lecture, is one of the activity in order to fulfill this mission and the vision of Tracy's uh, Tracy. So Tracy lecture, let me give a brief introduction to Tracy lecture. Uh, this is the fourth Tracy lecture. It's an annual lecture and it's a public lecture primarily focused on the Christian community as an evening program where the speaker, a resource person who is a specialist in a particular subject, uh, addresses on a relevant issue around the country or the world. And uh, today we have the fourth Tracy lecture. The previous lectures were the first one on peace and conflict by Reverend Dr. Vinod Ramachandra. And the second one was on Christianity and culture by Mr. L.T. Jayachandran. And the third one was on climate change by Reverend Dr. Parveen Pedamala in 2019. And uh, there was a gap of two years where we could not conduct the Tracy annual lecture due to the pandemic. But God has enabled us this year, after two years of gap, to have the fourth Tracy annual lecture online so that uh, more could participate. And when we planned for this program, we were also unsure whether we would be able to hold a physical meeting, perhaps in God's goodness and providence. Because it's an online meeting, many of us are able to participate in this program from far and wide. So, uh, and this is the first online Tracy lecture. And in this lecture, as the flyer has already announced, we are commemorating the centenary year of Reverend Dr. John Stott through this lecture. So I will give a little bit more of introduction uh, to John Stott. I am very much sure that everybody knows John Stott, uh, but however, in case for some of you who do not know more about him, a brief introduction I will be giving later. Now we will take time for an opening prayer and a word of greetings from Dr. Jacob Suryan, who is the uh, chair chairperson of Tracy's governing board. So over to Dr. Jacob Suryan for the opening prayer and the greetings. Thank you, brother Isaac. Thank you for a wonderful introduction to the Tracy meeting. Now, before we start the meeting with a word of prayer, we would, of course, like to thank Brother 
Matthew for his long association. Brother Matthew joined Tracy in 2015. For 30 years, he was a part of the UESI staff and uh, he was active. He was very, very committed and was a man of high integrity and commitment. His character and integrity are known to all of us. I have known him for the last 30 years and I have found he was a really a blessing to Tracy and to UESI with our organizations he was associated with. As he took on the difficult role of the director of Tracy from 2016, we thank him for the way the Lord used him as a blessing to this ministry. We thank him as we know that he will be continuing to be a part of us, even though he may not function as a director, but his advice and blessing would continue to be with each one of us. All of us continue to look to him for leadership, for encouragement, for friendship, and for all the guidance and support he continues to give. They say that it is the hearts that matter, for he lives in our hearts all the time, whether he's a director or not. And our love for and our love and affection for him will continue. We'd also request your prayers for Brother Satish as he takes over the role of Brother Matthew. Most of us are familiar with Brother John Stott. Most of us have heard of the Tyndale commentaries, and he was the founding author for it. And uh, he was a blessing. His life was a blessing for each of us. And uh, as we continue the meeting, let us bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and mercy. We thank you for your mercy. As we remember the life of Brother Matthew Verghese, we thank you, O Lord. As we remember the tremendous gift you have given us through the light life of Brother John Stott. We thank you for bringing Brother Chris right in our midst. And we pray, O Lord, that this would be a time of blessing to each one of us as we participate in this meeting. We pray this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Dr. Jacob Charyan, for this word of greetings and also appreciating Mr. Matthew Varghese, our former director, and uh, uh, Mr. Satish Joseph Simon, our new director, who has assumed the responsibility and the uh, role of uh, responsibility of the director of JC uh, from today onwards. So uh, I will. Uh, I will give a detailed introduction and special welcome to our special guest this evening later. But before I do that, let me also introduce John Stott. Uh, little bit, very briefly, uh, to John Stott about uh, to, to all of us. Uh, as most of us know, John Stott, we are celebrating the centenary year of John Stott. So he was born on 27th April, 1921. And uh, this one year celebration is going on uh, through Langham partnerships and various ministries associated and various ministries which are blessed by John Stott and his ministry. And he was called to glory on 27 July 2011. In 2005, the Time magazine placed John Stott among the 100 most influential people in the world. However, it is quite unfortunate that many Bible believing Christians many including evangelical Christians who haven't recognized the contribution of John Stott properly. That is why even today when we are together here, here we are not to exalt John Stott, but here we are to exalt the name of the Lord of John Stott because this single passion was the glory and the, if I use the correct and exact word of John Stott, the greater glory and honor of Jesus Christ. He lived, ministered, wrote, engaged, taught, and traveled all over the world for the greater glory and honor of Christ. Even through this lecture, we want to see that we would be able to bring greater glory and honor to our Lord Jesus Christ. According to Billy Graham, John Stott represents a touchstone of authentic biblical scholarship that has scarcely been paralleled since the days of the 16th century 
European reformers. In his book, The Glory of Preaching, Darrell Johnson describes John Stott as the purest expository preacher in history. What a great tribute. The purest expository preacher in history. And uh, Alistair Chapman has written a critical uh, biography of John Stott titled as Godly Ambition. In that, the concluding statement he makes is this, few did more than John Stott to shape global Christianity in the 20th century. Let me repeat that again. Few did more than John Stott to shape global Christianity in the 20th century. So John Stott's influence and involvement on the Lausanne movement and IFES is commendable. His contribution to develop pastors and theologians from the developing nations through his initiatives of LICC, that is London Institute of Contemporary Christianity, and Langham Partnership is definitely noteworthy. And as we have already mentioned about Langham Partnership earlier in our informal discussion, Langham Partnership was initiated and founded by John Stott in 1969, originally as Langham Trust, which is now grown as an international organization, spreads over in 52 countries. And Langham Partnership primarily uh, exists to serve the church in the developing nation, to develop teachers, scholars, and theologians, and leaders, Christian leaders, authentic disciples and leaders for the churches in the developing nations. And through the work of Langham Partnership, they have developed uh, by now around 300 Langham scholars. And we are really blessed. The Indian church is blessed with many Langham scholars. Uh, I hope that some of them are with us this evening, perhaps God willing, after we close officially, if some of them are there, we would give them time to perhaps share a few minutes uh, after the official, uh, if we close, to be during the informal time. So uh, we are really grateful for the contribution and the Ministry of Langham Partnership, especially for the church in India. Now, it is my pleasure and privilege to welcome and introduce uh, Reverend Dr. Chris Wright. Chris Wright's official name is Christopher J.H. Wright. Christopher J.H. Wright. He's a missiologist, a leading missiologist today, and an Anglican pastor and an Old Testament scholar. He is currently the International Ministries Director of Langham Partnership International, and that for the last 21 years. He was the principal of All Nations Christian College, UK, and he was faculty at Union Biblical Seminary for around five years, where I think some of the participants of this program had the privilege of learning from him. And he has written over 20 books and many articles. As an Old Testament scholar, many of his writings deals with various themes in the Old Testament and mission. His, he has a wide range of teaching ministry, especially through Langham partnerships. So we are really privileged to have a very close associate friend uh, of John Stott, who is heading the Langham partnership, which was originally uh, founded by John Stott. And uh, today's theme is Christian Christians in the public square. Today's topic of our lecture is very close to the heart of Stott. And uh, uh, perhaps, uh, not perhaps, uh, definitely Reverend Dr. Uh, Chris Wright is the right person, uh, the most uh, able person to deal with this subject, especially as we celebrate the life and legacy of John Stott together. So over to Dr. Chris Wright. And once again, on behalf of Tracy and on behalf of all of us, I extend a very, very hearty welcome to Reverend Dr. Chris Wright. Over to Chris Wright. Thank you so much, Isaac. That was a very warm uh, welcome. Um, and uh, as you say, indeed, uh, I, I did take over from John Stott and the Ministries of the Langham Partnership 20 years ago. Uh, and we have a large number of Langham scholars and also, of course, support a number of seminaries. And also now a, a very strong Langham preaching 
movement or movements actually within India uh, run by uh, Praveen and Veena Banyan, but also with regional uh, preaching movements in, in several different language uh, parts of India. And as you rightly say, uh, John Stott, having founded the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity, and one or two of the participants said uh, that they actually studied there in London under John Stott years ago, that was set up by John because he strongly believed that Christians ought to be engaged in the public square, in the professions and in their secular lives, as it were, to bring the gospel as salt and light into the world around us. And uh, so the, the lecture which I've prepared and which will be coming up as, as a screened video in just a moment uh, is very much in that area. Is God really interested in the whole area of uh, political and economic and social life, the life uh, of the public arena. So that's what um, I'm going to be talking about. Um, I, as I said, it was recorded a little while ago and I sent it so that I wouldn't have to sit here and talk the whole time, but you can listen to the, the lecture as, as a video. And then uh, after that, I'll still be here and we can have some uh, question and answer or discussion and people may want to make comments and thoughts of their own because I'm and our topic today is what I've called saints in the public square. Let me just share my screen so we can see that. Uh, there are various terms actually for what we're talking about in this lecture, uh, the marketplace, the workplace, the secular world, the public arena and so on. I'm just calling it for the moment the public square, by which I mean the whole world of human work, trade, professions, law, government, education, industry, the arts, the sciences, etc. Wherever human beings uh, engage together to get things done. The Old Testament word for this actually was the gate. That is quite literally the public square just inside the walls of the town or the village where people met and did their business together of whatever kind that was. This is the world of human social engagement and economic activity. It's actually where most people, including most Christians, spent most of our time one way or another. So let's uh, think first of all for a little while about God and the public square. Uh, and the question really is, is God interested in that? Many Christians seem to operate on the everyday assumption that God is not really interested in the public world or the so-called secular world. Or at least they presume that God is interested in the workplace only as a place for potential evangelism. God, it would seem on this opinion, God cares about the church and about its affairs and about getting people to heaven, but not about how society and its public places are conducted here on earth. And the result of that can be a very dichotomized way of thinking and living as Christians. Because obviously many of us, most of you probably, have to invest most of the time that matters, that is our working lives, in a place and a task that we think doesn't really matter much to God, while we're struggling to find opportunities to give some leftover time, whatever we can, to the only thing that we think does matter to God, such as evangelism or prayer or working in the church. And so we have this great divide between my work which is most of our time, and God's work, which is hopefully a bit of our time, which is very unsatisfying, very frustrating, and actually very unbiblical. Because the Bible, it seems to me, both clearly and comprehensively in both Testaments, portrays God as intensely interested in human public life and work. Interested, yes, and involved, and in charge, and indeed, thoroughly intentional. So let's think then uh, about this. Here we go. God and the public square. First of all, God created it. You see, work is God's idea. Genesis 1 and 2 give us our first picture of the God of the Bible, and it presents God to us. God presents himself to us as a worker. There he is, thinking, choosing, planning, executing, and evaluating something that he does and accomplishes. God works. So when God decides to create humankind in the image and likeness of God, what else could humans be but workers, reflecting in their working lives something of the nature of God himself? 
And specifically, God laid upon human beings the task of ruling the earth in Genesis chapter 1 and of serving and keeping it in Genesis chapter 2. So this enormous task required, first of all, the, the complementarity of being created male and female for mutual help, because a man is no good at this task alone. No, it's, it's a task that is built in with some other fundamental economic and ecological dimensions of human life. God has given us a planet with a vast diversity of resources that are scattered all over the surface of the earth. So there is, at a very basic level, an obvious need for trade and exchange between groups of people living in different places so as to meet one another's needs. And that task, in turn, necessitates economic relationships. And so there's a need for fairness and justice through the whole social and economic realm on this planet Earth. There needs to be justice, both in the sharing of raw resources with which we work, and also in the distribution and the products of our work. So the biblical witness is then that all of this human endeavor, all of this human work, is part of God's intention for human life on earth. Work matters because God made us workers by God himself created in his image. So then uh, to come back to our screen, uh, perhaps the first thing that we have to ask those who are Christians who are working in the marketplace, in, in the public arena is, do you see your work as nothing more than a necessary evil something that you've got to get through, or perhaps at best a context for evangelistic opportunities? Or do you see it as a means of glorifying God through participating in God's purposes for creation, and therefore that your work has some intrinsic value to you and to God? How do you relate what you do in your daily work to the Bible's teaching about human responsibility in creation and society? Those are good questions to ask at the, very, at the very upfront. But then we move on to a second thing here that the Bible teaches us about God and the public square and the world of work, and that is that God audits it. Now, I think we're probably all fairly familiar with the function of an auditor. The auditor provides independent, impartial, and objective scrutiny of a company or a charity's activities and claims. The auditor has access to all the documents, all the evidence. Uh, to him, all books are open, all decisions known, and from him, no secrets are hidden. Auditors inspect, they inquire, they examine, they disclose. Well, that at least is the theory. Now, according to the Bible, God is the auditor. He is the independent judge of all that goes on in the public square in the arena of human social life. The Old Testament speaks repeatedly of Yahweh, the God of Israel, as the God who sees and knows and evaluates. And this is true uh, in a most universal sense of every individual. Here again, as we move back to our screen, you take a, a place like Psalm 33, where we read that from heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on the earth. He forms the hearts of all and he considers everything they do. That's an auditing function. But it's specifically the public square that Israel was repeatedly reminded that that's where God calls for justice. Justice in the gate, as the prophets would say, that is in the public square, the marketplace, the court. For example, in Amos chapter 5, where God says, I know how many are your offenses and how great are your sins. You oppress the righteous and you take bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. But, says God, you need to hate evil and love good and maintain justice in the courts. And furthermore, God hears the kind of talk that goes on in the underhand, secret, greedy world of some kinds of business practices and trading. Here's Amos chapter eight, where God says, hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain? And when will the Sabbath be ended that we can market our wheat? 
skimping the measure, boosting the price, cheating with dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. But the Lord says, I will never forget what they have done. God is the auditor. He sees, he hears, he knows. And for those who think that God is confined to the temple and the temple courts uh, in the Old Testament or the church, as we might say today, and sees only what is going on there in religious observance, Jeremiah brings something of a shock uh, that God is also watching what goes on in the rest of the week in the public sphere. And so Jeremiah asks in chapter 7, will you steal and murder and commit adultery and perjury and burn incense to Baal and follow other gods that you've not known? And then come before me and stand in this house which bears my name and say, we are saved. What? Safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But, says God, I have been watching, declares the Lord. So yes, God is the auditor, the independent inspector of all that happens in the public arena. And what he therefore demands, as auditors should, is complete transparency, integrity. This was the standard that was expected of human judges in their exercise of public office. And one, one interesting example of this is the case of Samuel. Uh, at the end of his life, when he was handing over, as it were, the, the authority and saying he'd grown too old, he defends his public record and he calls both the people and God to witness, as it were, as his divine auditor. Here I'm reading from 1 Samuel chapter 12, where Samuel said to all Israel, I've listened to everything that you've said to me. I've set this king over you. That's, of course, King Saul. Now you have a king as your leader. As for me, I'm old and gray and my sons are here with you. And he says, I've been your leader from my youth until this day. So here I stand. Testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I stolen? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? From whose hand have I accepted a bribe to make me shut my eyes? If I have done any of these things, I will make it right, says Samuel. And the people reply, you have not cheated or oppressed us. You have not taken anything from the Lord's hand. And Samuel said to them, the Lord is witness against you and his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. Samuel stands there as a model of accountability, transparency and integrity because he knew that God was his judge. So I think the, the next question we have to ask of those who are at work in the world then is how and when do you consciously submit to God's audit of your daily work? In what way does your accountability to God, not just to your boss, affect the way you do your work? Do you see yourself as working for God and before God in his presence, day by day, at the desk, in the place of work, wherever it is that God is the auditor? So the world of work, God created it, God audits it. Now here's a, a third perspective that the Bible brings uh, to the public's, uh, public awareness, the public arena, and that is that God governs it and judges it. Now, we know, of course, that human public life, the marketplace, or just the market as it's sometimes called, is made up of human choices for which human beings are accountable and responsible. The markets behave, as we're told in economic theory, as the outcome of millions upon millions of individual human choices. So in that sense, all that happens in the public arena, in the marketplace, is a matter of human action and choice and moral responsibility. And yet, at the same time, the Bible puts it all under God's sovereign government. See, the Bible affirms both sides of this, paragraph, of this paradox. On the one hand, human beings are morally responsible for our choices and our actions and the public consequences that they have. And yet, on the other hand, 
God retains sovereign control over the final outcomes and destinies of human public life in the economic and in the political sphere. And there are many Bible stories that, that illustrate this. Uh, here, here, here are some. Let me go back uh, to our slides here. There's the story of Joseph. Familiar story there in Genesis, which moves from family life and then into the public arena in Egypt at the highest level of state power in relation to political and agricultural and economic and even foreign affairs. And in those narratives, all the human actors are personally morally responsible for their own motives and words and actions, whether good or evil. But the words of Joseph to his brothers at the very end of the story and the end of the book of Genesis express God's view of all that had been happening through that long story. We read there in Genesis 50 that Joseph said to them, don't be afraid, am I in place of God? And then he says, you, you, my brothers, you intended to harm me. Literally, it is you meant it for evil, he says. He's not making any excuses for them. They chose to do what they did to sell him into slavery and everything else. You intended it for evil, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. That's God's sovereignty over human actions. And the same perspective, of course, shapes the stories of Daniel and Esther. And in all three cases, Joseph, Daniel and Esther, the public arena is pagan, as we might say. That is, these events take place in nations that are quite outside the covenant community of Israel. The human political authorities, in all three cases, Egypt, Babylon, Persia, they bear no allegiance to Yahweh, the God of Israel. And yet, in all three cases, it is the will of Yahweh, the God of Israel, that governs the outcomes of all their political and economic decisions. So it's, it's significant then that when the prophets turn their attention to the great empires of their day, they affirm God's government just as much over those other nations and empires as over his own covenant people Israel. And that includes their public works, the marketplace, just as much as, as the military and all their adventures in conquering others. So, for example, um, Isaiah chapter 19 puts the whole of Egypt under God's judgment, including its religion, its uh, irrigation project, its agriculture, its fisheries, its textile industry, its politicians, its universities. It's all, as it were, under the governing judgment of God. Or you look at Ezekiel chapter 26 and 28, that's a sustained lament for the great seaport city of Tyre when God's judgment would fall on them for their domination of the maritime trade routes that stretched right across the Mediterranean. So they're portrayed as a great trading ship filled with the cargoes of the nations, which God sinks in the depths of the sea to great fear, trembling. Or we think again uh, of Daniel uh, and Daniel chapter 4, which portrays the arrogance of King Nebuchadnezzar, who's gloating over his city. And he says, is not this great Babylon, which I have built as my royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? But the verdict of God was that his whole building project was on the backs of the poor and the oppressed. As Daniel points out to him, when he says in verse 27, therefore my king be pleased to accept my advice, renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed, and then it may be that your prosperity will continue. Well, Nebuchadnezzar refused to take that advice and instead of humbling himself, he found himself humiliated into a more sober frame of mind. And in that Daniel chapter 4, the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar had to learn uh, was that God governs the public square along with everything else. Or in Daniel's more graphic words that, he, that are there in the, in the mouth of Nebuchadnezzar, heaven rules and the most high God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. And so that's why you see, 
at the end of the great Bible narrative in the book of Revelation, uh, in Revelation chapter 18, Babylon becomes the code name for the whole global economic political system. And, and it portrays God as the ultimate judge on its greed and injustice and cruel oppression that causes so much human suffering. And so that means therefore that I think the third question that we have to ask of those who are seeking to follow Jesus in the so-called secular workplace and marketplace out there in the public square is, where and how do you perceive the governance of God in the marketplace? Seeing God as the one who's in charge. What does it mean in that sense to do as Jesus said and to seek first the kingdom of God, the sovereignty of God, the rule of God and his justice? And what difference does it make when you do? Is it simply the case that heaven rules, to quote Daniel, on Sundays, but the market rules from Monday to Friday and Saturday's a kind of day off for everybody? Or are we thinking through this issue more carefully in terms of how we relate the sovereign governance of God to the world of public affairs in the political and international arena? And so we turn then to our fourth perspective uh, on the whole biblical world of work. And it's a glorious surprise. And that is that God redeems it. And that I hope may come as something of a surprise because a pretty common Christian assumption that many people make is that everything that happens here on earth is nothing more than temporary and transient and really has nothing to do with God or eternity. Life here is, is just a kind of vestibule, a kind of entrance lobby for eternity. So it doesn't really matter very much. It, it, it just we don't need to bother about it too much. That's what many Christians think. And that very negative view of life on the earth, I think is, is partly drawn from a mistaken interpretation of the language of Second Peter chapter three, where we, it talks about the apparent obliteration, the destruction of the whole earth, and indeed of all the physical creations, creation. And if that's where it's all headed, you know, it's all just going to be burnt up, uh, then what eternal value can there possibly be to the work that we do in the here and now in this world? But the point I would want to make here is, is this, coming back to our, our screen, that that passage there in 2 Peter 3 is really talking about the destruction of the evil world of human sin, the, the cleansing of the earth from the ungodly, just as in the first half of the chapter, Peter talks about the, the destruction of the wicked in the flood, Noah's flood, when the world, world was destroyed, he uses that word, by water. And in the same way, he says, it will be destroyed by fire. He's using the symbolism of fire uh, as a cleansing metaphor, purging, not the total obliteration, but the cleansing and purging of the earth. So you see, this is the... This is the very different perspective that the Bible presents on this, that God plans ultimately to redeem all that he has made. Because, as Psalm 145 tells us, God loves all that he has made. And included within all that God has made is all that we have made with what God has made, or what God has given to us, as, as it were. Our use of creation, our enhancement and development of creation, in the great cultural mandate of our civilizations. Now, of course, of course, we know that all that we human beings have done on this earth has been tainted, twisted, spoiled by our sinful, fallen human nature. We are sinners. And just as we need to be cleansed and purified by God, so also do all our works. But you see, that's exactly the picture that we have in both the Old and the New Testament. It's a vision of redemption, not obliteration, of cleansing and restoration of all that is good and valuable in God's creation and in what we have done with it. 
There's a wonderful passage in Isaiah 65, which expresses this, that's particularly verses 17 to 25, where we have this glorious portrayal of what God says, I am creating a new heaven and a new earth, a whole new creation, says God. And it looks forward to human life in this new creation that will be long, no longer will be subject to weariness and decay and death, in which there will be the fulfillment of family life and working life, in which all the curses of frustration and injustice and unfairness will be gone forever, in which there will be close, joyful fellowship with God, and also, indeed, in which there will be environmental harmony and safety within the animal and vegetable creation. The whole of human life, private life, family life, public life, will be redeemed and restored by God to glorifying productiveness. That's Isaiah's vision there in Isaiah 65. And this is not just Old Testament stuff, because the New Testament carries this vision forward in the light of the redemption achieved by Christ through his cross, and especially, of course, in the light of his resurrection, which we are told is the first fruits of the new creation. Paul is speaking about the whole creation when in Colossians chapter 1 he talks five times about all things in heaven and on earth. And he says that this totality, this creational totality of, of the heavens and the earth has not only been created by Christ and for Christ and is being sustained by Christ, but it's also redeemed by Christ through the blood of his cross. That's there in that incredible passage, Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 20. And because of this plan of redemption that God has for the whole of creation and for ourselves, it means that we look forward to the redemption of ourselves and creation together. As Paul puts it in Romans 8, that the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. But the creation was subjected to frustration. Yes, of course, because of our sin and evil, not by its own choice but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope, that is, in the certainty that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. And that's why, therefore, the final vision of the Bible there in Revelation chapter 21 and 22 is not of us escaping from the earth to go to some other place up in heaven, but rather of God coming down to live with us again in a cleansed and restored creation from which all evil will have been purged. And John describes that new creation as the city of God, doesn't he? And, and he sees all the glory of human civilization cleansed and purified of all evil being brought into the city of God. Here's what he says in Revelation 21, verses 24 to 27. The nations will walk by its light that is, the light of Christ himself in the city of God. And the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there'll be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Uh, those words, splendor, glory, honor of kings and nations that must mean that the combined product of generations of human beings whose lives and effort and work have generated this vast store of human culture and civilization. In other words, what will be brought into the city of God in the new creation? I think what these verses are telling us will be this vast accumulated output of human work through the ages. All, of course, purged of evil, restored, redeemed, and then laid at the feet of Christ in order to enhance the life of eternity in God's new creation. That's where it is all headed. That's what God's plan for it is, redemption. Not simply taking all that humanity has ever done through all the generations of human life and just kind of tossing it into a cosmic incinerator. No, God's plan ultimately is its redemption, purging and restoration. And I wonder, doesn't that, doesn't that transform 
uh, our whole attitude and perspective to Monday mornings when we go to the world of our work. So what this is saying is that all human history that, that takes place within the marketplace of public human interaction will be redeemed and purged and in some sense fulfilled in the new creation, not just abandoned and destroyed, which means that all our human work has value. It has significance, not just because of our role within creation from the beginning, when God told us to do this stuff, to be rulers and servants of creation, but also because of the new creation and the eschatological hope that it sets before us. And so with, with such a hope, then we can heartily follow Paul's exhortation. Do you remember it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he's talked all about the resurrection of Jesus and how important that is? And where he says, therefore, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord, that is in the risen Lord Jesus Christ, is not in vain. Knowing that the work we do for the Lord isn't just religious work, so to speak, but any work that is done as unto the Lord, which includes even the manual labor of slaves as Paul would tell them in Colossians and Ephesians. So coming back to our questions then, it seems to me that uh, what we've seen here is that, uh, th th that if this is the future prospect for the marketplace, then we need to be asking ourselves, in what ways is my daily labor, what I have to do for most of my time, in what sense it is it transformed by the knowledge that in some way, it is contributing to what God will one day redeem and include within the new creation. Now, I don't know how that will be. I don't know that it means that every report I have to write or every brick I have to lay or every piece of work that I do, somehow that's going to be there in heaven, as it were. But that there is something about this which is saying that just as God has the power to restore my resurrection body, to be what he wants it to be in the new creation. It doesn't mean that this thumb is just going to be there in heaven. It means that I, as I am in my person, as this embodied human being, God will redeem and restore and resurrect to new life in the new creation. So it will be also for our work. So then, what have we seen? We've seen God's view, God's view of the public square. The social world of work, of economics, of politics, of government. And according to the Bible, God created it, he audits it, he governs and judges it, and he will ultimately redeem it. So that leads us on then uh, to thinking now about, well, then what ought to be the attitude and the role and the mission of God's people in that sphere? What about Christians, us believers, in the public sphere. And once again, the Bible has got plenty to say on that. So here we go to that. Christians in the public square. And here I've got two things that I want to say that, first of all, we are called to engagement, but at the same time, we are called to distinctiveness. Those two things, engagement and distinctiveness. Let's think of each of them in turn. First of all, we are called to engagement. And how can we be doing that? Well, first of all, it can very simply be done by actually serving the state, by actually engaging in public or political or civic office. The Old Testament, as we've seen, contains quite notable examples of believers, that is, believers in the God of Israel, uh, who were engaged in the public arena, in the service, as we saw, of pagan empires and powers, like Joseph and Daniel. But, you know, the New Testament also urges Christians to be good citizens, good workers, paying our taxes uh, and so on, and therefore to be good witnesses to our creator and redeemer God. Work is still a creational good. That's to say it is a good thing to work and it's good to do good by working. In fact, Paul quite frequently instructs Christians to be doers of good. It's, it's all one word uh, in Greek, good doers. Uh, not uh, not goody-goodies, but, but doers of good. 
And when Paul uses that kind of language, it doesn't just mean being nice. Those terms that Paul uses, there were, there were two or three of them, they all had a common social meaning in his day, which people understood. Doers of good referred to people in society who did notable acts of public service or benefaction, benefactors they were known as for wider society whether they might be Roman citizens who perhaps built some swimming pool or some baths or some temple or some theater, uh, and then their name would go on there as a benefactor, a good doer, someone who had benefited society. And what Paul is saying is that Christians should be among those whose work is out there in the world for the common good, and thereby to commend the gospel, which is good news. And one example of this actually in the New Testament is Erastus, who you may or may not have heard of uh, because he only gets referred to twice. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 22, he's one of Paul's companions. So for part of his time, he was traveling with Paul. But then at the end of Romans, we read that Erastus had become the director of public works for the city of Corinth, which was actually a very responsible and pretty senior civic role major responsibilities to make sure that the food supply was there, the water supply was there to keep peace and law and order and so on. And there's Erastus, a Christian believer, serving Corinth, a Roman city of that time. So we can serve in the public arena. A second way, of course, that we can engage publicly is by praying for and seeking the welfare of the city. Now those words as you probably know, come from Jeremiah's letter to the exiles in Babylon, in Jeremiah chapter 29, uh, where in verse 7 he says, Also seek the welfare of the city where I have put you, and pray to the Lord for it. Now that's, <laughs> that's a pretty astonishing instruction, because remember, those people of Judah were exiles in the land of an enemy, who had destroyed their city and their temple, and had dragged them a thousand miles away from home. They, they were prisoners of war. They were captives in Babylon. And yet Jeremiah says, yeah, well, seek the welfare of that city. Pray for that city. God tells them, you see, to, to remember their calling as the children of Abraham. They were to be a blessing to all nations, even their enemies, in the way they lived and prayed and worked and simply cared for the welfare of the people who were around them. And what a challenge that is for us as Christians, if that was what the exiles of Judah were supposed to be doing. And I wonder perhaps whether Paul had that letter of Jeremiah in mind when he told Timothy to make sure that his churches were regularly praying for the state authorities, meaning, of course, in his day, the Roman authorities and government. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2 verse 2, I urge then, first of all, that petitions and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. Many churches that I've been in never seem to pray for the secular authorities, for the, the government, for judges, for uh, their president and so on. It's important that we engage in the public arena, not just through service and action and work, but also through prayer. And then thirdly, of course, another way in which we engage in the public square is one that's open to anybody. In fact, probably most of you is that we can do it by ordinary, honest, everyday work. It seems that uh, in some of the churches that Paul knew, particularly the one that he very early had founded in Thessalonica, that some people were thinking, you see, that ordinary work was no longer really any value. And they became lazy. And, and then they spiritualized their idleness with saying, well, you know, Jesus is coming back soon, so we can just give up our jobs. We don't need to work anymore. Well, Paul agreed with them, of course, about Christ's return but he didn't approve of that kind of attitude, that they were just opting out of normal human responsibilities and work and becoming idle and lazy. 
No, he says, and here's from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, no, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your hands, just as we did, and as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and that you will not be dependent on anybody. And of course, Paul could appeal to his own example, as one who had supported himself uh, through his own labour. He worked for his living in the secular workplace as a tent maker. As he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, labouring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. And we did this, he adds, in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. So you see, Paul insists then that in serving others in society by working, we are also serving God. In fact, even to Christian slaves who would be working for non-Christian pagan masters who might be very cruel, Paul can say to them, you know, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. So I think we need to recover a really much more biblical understanding of service and work. Or what we think of sometimes when we use this word ministry. Because, you know, sadly, we still suffer from this dichotomized split worldview in which the word ministry is confined to full-time paid work within the church or paid by the church, such as a pastor or an evangelist or a theological teacher or a missionary or whatever else it might be. And everything else that isn't, as it were, church-based isn't ministry. No, it's just work. But ministry, serving, service, servanthood, is what we are all called to in all of life as servants of God and as disciples of Christ. I mean, there are all kinds of ministries that are available to us, including in the so-called, falsely so-called, secular callings. The public sphere out there in the world can be just as much a place of ministry as the church. In Romans 13, for example, it's interesting that Paul speaks about the Roman governing authorities as servants of God. And he uses the exact same words that are also used for ministers in the church, diakonoi theu. Political service, judicial service, can also be the service of God. Ministry, in other words. And then uh, in Acts chapter 6, uh, the same word, diakonia, ministry or service, is used both of the ministry of the word, to which the apostles were called, and the ministry of tables for which the seven were appointed. One was a teaching ministry, serving the scriptures. The other was a social ministry, serving food. But both were ministries. One was a priority for the apostles. The other was a priority for those who were selected and appointed to do it. It was their calling. Now, the text does not say that one form of ministry was more important than the other, only that the apostles knew what was the priority for them as apostles, not necessarily the priority for all the rest of the believers, because others had got other callings and ministries to attend to. Here's something that John Stott said about this, which I think is rather well said. I think I've had that up already. Yes, here it is. Here's what John Stott says. It's in his book, The Contemporary Christian. He says, it is a wonderful thing to be a missionary or a pastor if God calls us to it. But it is equally wonderful to be a Christian lawyer, industrialist, politician, manager, social worker, television script writer, journalist or homemaker if God calls us to it. According to Romans 13 verse 4, an official of the state, whether legislator, magistrate, policeman or policewoman, is just as much a minister of God, diakonos theu, as a pastor. There is a crying need, says John Stott, for Christian men and women who see their daily work as their primary Christian ministry 
and who determine to penetrate their secular environment for Christ. But if we are to penetrate that secular environment, the public square, the workplace for Christ, then we need something more than just engagement with it, which is what we've been talking about. We are also called to distinctiveness. So we're to be engaged, yes, but we're to be engaged as Christians, as saints in the marketplace, because we are called to be holy, which basically means to be different, to be distinctive. This calling on distinctiveness, this moral distinctiveness to start with, was actually an essential part of the faith of Old Testament Israel. Here's a passage in Leviticus chapter 18, uh, where God is wanting the Israelites to understand that he wanted them to be what he says in chapter 19, wanted them to be holy. But what does that mean? Well, he says, you must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live, and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I'm bringing you, where you're going to live. Do not follow their practices. No, you must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees because I am the Lord your God. So keep my decrees and laws for the man who obeys them will live by them because I am the Lord. And you see, that's actually what holiness meant for Israel. It meant being different different from the idolatrous cultures around them, whether the empire of Egypt or the kind of health, wealth and prosperity Baal cult uh, of Canaan. And so that distinctiveness, that holiness was to be worked out ethically, morally, in everyday, ordinary social life. So if you go on to read Leviticus chapter 19, yeah, it starts with be holy, for I am the Lord your God, am holy. But then it goes on to articulate that, to explain what that means in a whole range of contexts, which are personal, family life, social life, the workplace, employment practices, the law courts, the fields, the farm, even ethnic relationships and in business and commercial realms. So you see this distinctiveness of God's people in the Bible, it's not just religious. It, it's not just as if we're saying, well, we happen to worship a different God from you guys, so that's why we've got this religion and you've got that religion. No, no, it's meant to be ethical distinctiveness. We are called to live by different standards. And that, I think, is what Jesus means when he talks about how his followers, his disciples, are salt, salt of the earth and the light of the world, he says in Matthew chapter 5. And those give us some crucial insights into what it means to belong to Jesus in the public arena. Because those two metaphors, salt and light, they combine to remind us, don't they, that the world around us is both corrupt and dark. See, salt stops meat or fish becoming bad and rotten, and light obviously dispels the darkness. So these are active agents that make a difference in the surrounding, penetrating the food and sustaining it or shining in the dark room. So Jesus means that his disciples must be like that. So when Christians, when you or I were engaged in our places of work, things ought to be a bit less rotten, a bit less dark. <laughs> Not of course that, we can make everything perfect. Of course not. Uh, we're not Jesus himself. The end has not yet come. But we should be making some difference. And did you notice also when you read those verses how Jesus says that our light should shine, not by our wonderful testimony and our great preaching, but by our good works. He says, let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works. It's by the way we live, the way we behave that it should be attractive and ultimately drawing two people to glorify our Heavenly Father. And once again, uh, I can just share with you something that John Stott used to like to, to say when he was preaching on this. I've heard him say these things several times. He would say, look, if a piece of meat goes rotten, it's no use blaming the meat, because that's what happens when bacteria do their work. The question to ask is, 
where was the salt? And if a house gets dark at night, it's no use blaming the house. That's what happens when the sun goes down. The question to ask is, where is the light? So if society becomes more corrupt and more dark, it's no use blaming society. That's what fallen human nature does all by itself. The question to ask is, where are the Christians? Where are the saints who will actually live as saints? God's different people, God's salt and light in those places of public life and work. And as I said earlier, Paul applied this even to slaves who in the Roman world of his day must have had just about the worst possible deal of any workplace. And yet Paul tells Christian slaves, even in that condition, he says, this is Colossians 3, he says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it, not just when their eye is on you to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and in reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, as slaves, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. And why should slaves behave in that way? Well, this is what Paul writes a little bit later to Titus. In Titus chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, Paul says, Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted. Why? So that in every way they can make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. You see, as Christians, we are called to moral distinctiveness, to be ethically distinctive in the workplace for the sake of the gospel of God our Savior. And why should we live like that? Well, this is the other part of what I said, that it's not just because of our moral distinctiveness, but also because of our worldview distinctiveness. You see, as Christians, we are living in the Bible story. And it's that great Bible story which sees the whole of human life, work, ambitions, achievements, all of them valid in their own way, all of them intended by God to be part of his creation and what we do and his redemption and his future plans. But we see all of that, all our work in the context of the overarching biblical story of God's creation through to new creation. In other words, we refuse to make an idol out of the marketplace itself, whether our own personal work there or the market or mammon, the god of greed and financial advancement. Why? We don't make those things our idols because we recognize the ultimate highest reality and we worship the living God alone. You see, even for Christians, work can very easily become an idol, especially if it gets linked into our greed and our acquisitiveness for what our work produces, then it easily begins to take the place of God. And that's why we have this warning uh, in the book of Deuteronomy there in chapter 8, verses 17 and 18, where uh, Moses says to the people of Israel, you, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands has produced all this wealth for me. But remember, it's the Lord your God who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant which he made to your forefathers. So it's not all for you. It's not all just because you made it. It's ultimately God who gives you that ability and he's the one you must worship. So yes, we affirm that work has its value. It has its importance in what it means to be human. But we also affirm the Sabbath which reminds us that all our work is intended to find rest and fulfillment in the enjoyment of God. Work is not the primary thing in human life. It's not the totality of life. God is. So with this worldview then, God is not an escape from our work. God is not a crutch to help us endure our work. Rather, God is actively involved in all our work in the world, in the public arena in our engagement and our distinctiveness.
But I want to finish. And I want to finish with a word to any of you who may be pastors or church leaders in some way. And I want to urge you to accept that part of the function of the church, and especially of pastors, is to support those who live their lives daily as saints in this public arena, out there in the world. You see, Paul tells us, doesn't he, that God has given his church pastors and teachers to equip God's people for works of service, he says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. And I believe that that phrase, works of service, doesn't just mean Christian activities within the church, but all and any form of service that we may do as Christian believers in society and in the church. So this, this Ephesians 4, it turns right upside down one of the commonest misconceptions that still permeates many churches. Because, believe it or not, God did not invent the church to support the clergy. <laughs> Rather, God gave pastors and teachers to the church in order to equip the saints, God's people. People don't go to church on Sunday to support their pastor in his ministry. It's the other way around. The pastor goes to church on Sunday to support his people in their ministry, which is outside the church, out there in the world, being salt and light in the public square. And so the challenge then to pastors is, are you helping ordinary working Christians to understand the world they live in? Or are you just dangling before them every Sunday the prospect of a better world when we all get to heaven or something like that? Are you providing biblical teaching, a biblical worldview for working Christians in their lives and their witness? Are you helping Christians to wrestle with those ethical issues, those conscience issues that they struggle with in the workplace? Encouraging them to be faithful and to be men and women of integrity and courage and perseverance. Well, in order to do that, if that's what you should be doing, then, of course, it means that pastors and teachers in the church need to know those problems for themselves and not just live in some kind of spiritual or ecclesiastical bubble. Well, as I finish, I have to say that on this particular topic, I feel rather like a coward because my own working life uh, has mostly been spent not in the secular marketplace of the world, I did have a few years as a school teacher, and then I moved into the professional world of pastoral ministry and theological education. <coughs> but I do have a, a great admiration and indeed a great concern for all of you Christians who do engage every day of your working lives in the workplaces of the world, because you are the Daniels of this world, or at least you can be and you should be, you are the salt of the earth, as Jesus calls you. You are the, the light of the world. And what would it be like if all the millions of Christians who do earn their living in the secular workplace around the world were to take seriously what Jesus meant by being salt and light in the world? You see, your work matters because it matters to God, our creator and our redeemer. And what you do has got some place in God's plans for the new creation. So if you do it conscientiously, if you do it as a disciple of Jesus, willing to bear witness to him and if necessary to suffer for him, then he will enable you and your life to bear fruit in multiplying the citizens of that new creation from among your friends and your working colleagues. And so may God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Satish, uh, for screening this video talk by uh, Dr. Chris Wright. Am I audible enough? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because of lack of time, I don't dare to take, uh, uh, do a summary of what uh, uh, Dr. Chris has brought us through this video talk. It's, it was very clear. Personally, uh, we all have been encouraged, challenged, uh, I think, by this very crystal clear teaching from God's word about our role, uh, role in this world, especially in the marketplace or the public square. Uh, if I try to summarize the teaching in one sentence, uh, I, I, I know that uh, I'm trying something, something challenging, yet I would try to put it this way. We need to live with our whole of life 
by the whole gospel of Christ for God's concern in the whole world. Let me repeat that again. We need to live with our whole of life by the whole gospel of Christ for God's concerns in the whole world. So uh, now the time is open to the participants, uh, this brief time to interact, ask your questions, clarifications, or comments of the teaching given by uh, Reverend Chris Wright. Over to you. Thomas, can I raise a question? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Uh, uh, okay, uh, Dr. Chris, in, in your travels and, and seeing the development in the evangelical and the wider Christian community, do you really see a shift uh, on these issues of Christians, especially evangelicals, taking a strong position on social justice theme? Because uh, the other day when I was running one of the classes in this group, uh, it looked like the dominant view was still going back to the questions that John Stott and others had clarified at uh, Luzon in 1974 on the, in the Luzon Covenant and also the Grand Rapids document. Um, so I, I know that uh, TFN, World Vision have taken on very strong development agenda uh, but do you see a major shift uh, in um, missions in a way? We, we know towards relief and development, yes, but to the broader issues that you are highlighting. I just wanted to see how you felt of the global trend. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Denison. I, I must say that I... The answer, the simple answer to your question is not a great deal. I, I think... Um, this area of John Stott's thinking, namely that Christians ought to see ministry in a much wider sense than ordained ministry in the church and need to see mission as a much wider thing than simply evangelism and church planting. That dimension of John Stott's teaching and of uh, the Lausanne Covenant and so on, I think has been more neglected than really activated. Thankfully, there are I mean, there's still the London Institute, which is banging that drum here in the UK, and there are more churches here that do have a, a solid biblical theology of work and workplace ministry. Here at All Souls Church in London, which is my own church, uh, there's a fairly strong theology that ev for everyday work being where your ministry and vocation is, so serve God there. Um, but I think it is still the case that around the world, uh, there's a kind of retreat from the public arena because we think that's not really God's work. God isn't interested in it. And some of that is because of this very pessimistic view that, well, the world is all just going to be burnt up anyway, so why should we bother? We, we've lost a very strongly creational understanding uh, uh, of, of the Bible and therefore of mission. Um, and I noticed that one of the questions uh, in the chat uh, from Thomas Daniel is to notice that this was not always so, that uh, evangelicals in the 18th century especially uh, were passionately concerned for social reform, political reform, alongside spiritual evangelism and gospel work. They did both. Uh, they didn't see a big dichotomy between them. Uh, and it was really in the late 19th and early 20th century with the arrival of the so-called social gospel, when liberals were saying, we will bring in the kingdom of God. You don't need the cross and the atonement and personal salvation and all that. Just get better education, better economics, and, and we will bring the kingdom of God. And evangel evangelicals reacted against that uh, and said, no, the gospel is really about salvation. You have to be born again. Of course you do, and that was important but they then retreated from the social arena into a kind of spiritual gospel. And thankfully, I say thankfully, John Stott and the Lausanne movement pulled evangelicals back from that in the 1970s and 80s with the documents that you refer to in Grand Rapids and elsewhere. A lot of work was done in the 1980s. But sadly, as you say, uh, we still come across discussions and debates and arguments in, in Christian churches as to whether we should be involved in the social arena at all. And I just wonder sometimes, what Bible are you reading? <laughs> mm. Have you lost so much that God has to say in the scriptures about justice, not just in the mm. Old Testament, but Jesus himself says, 
that the really weighty matters of the law are justice and mercy and faithfulness. So I, I, I think we, we have a long way to go yet, but there are some signs of hope. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chris and uh, Dr. Jay Surya. Uh, there are some more questions in the chat box. One of the announcements which I would like to make is that uh, this session is being recorded and we will be uploading this uh, in YouTube later for those who have joined later or those who would like to again listen it once again. Okay, there is a question from Som Thomas, a uh, question for Dr. Wright. I cannot say how thankful I am for you uh, stating that my work in the marketplace is not just a vehicle for evangelism. However, I see a gap even in the thinking of uh, Indian Christians uh, who agree with you. They lack like a Christian outlook on public issues other than in relation to their work. Yes, they are efficient, ethical, and human at their daily work. But on a host of other issues that are uh, hurting the public square, Christians are absent in the public square. It could be caste, domestic violence, exploitative supply chains, economic policy, discrimination against Muslims. Where are the Christians who go beyond daily work to work side by side with Hindus and Muslims on these issues? Yeah, uh, thank you, um, Brother Som Thomas. That, I think, is a very valid question uh, because just as one might become very privatized in a personal spiritual life and then expand that a bit to say, yes, I'll be a Christian in my workplace uh, and seek to be faithful to Jesus and be a good disciple and work hard for the Lord, that still doesn't get to being salt and light in society uh, where there are issues of justice and injustice, uh, of violence and discrimination, uh, of climate change, which is one of the things you didn't mention, the environmental issues and so on, the sexual abuse and everything else. And I would want to say that, I didn't particularly say it in my lecture, but I would want to say that I think the Bible seems to suggest that God wants his people to be concerned about how society is run and to be involved in the means by which uh, God has ordained that society should be governed, i.e. through uh, politics, through judges, through kings and judges and so on. Uh, th there is a sense in which that public area is where Christians ought to be. Now, the problem is that, of course, it's a very tough area to be a Christian, and especially uh, in, in a country like India or some of the other countries where people are, I realize, on this call, uh, where there is a, a massively non-Christian majority in the country and where the government often is, is very much in collusion with a kind of religious nationalism of one sort or another, and where the Christian faith is, is very small, and very min minority. And yet that was how it was for most Christians through most of history uh, in many parts of the world and certainly back in the Roman Empire. And so when Paul says, yes, you should pray for kings and so on, when he allows Erastus to be a city governor uh, and when he says that magistrates do God's work, then I think there is a, there is a legitimate calling for some Christians to be willing to pay the cost and to some degree, sometimes the compromises uh, and the challenges of being engaged in public life uh, in a, at a political or in, in business or whatever else it is. Uh, and as I said, it can be costly, uh, but I think it's, it's sometimes where Christians can make a difference. I mean, the, the, already we've referred to the 19th, 18th and 19th century social reformers in Britain. Now, that was not easy. They paid the cost. It ruined their health and their bank balances, but they campaigned for decades in order to attack the slave trade and in order to get social reform in factories and for children and in housing uh, and everything else. So to be involved in that area is tough. And that's why I admire Christians who are in those areas uh, as salt and light. Um, in, in such situations. So that's, that's where I would encourage the, the question uh, and encourage at least some on the call to go into that area if you're not already there and to encourage others into it. Uh, there are some more comments and questions and words of appreciation and how each one of them was blessed uh, through this session. And uh, uh, since our time, official time is almost up, uh, let me take this time to just express our heartfelt gratitude and thanks uh, to Reverend Dr. Chris Wright for being with us this evening and uh, bringing us this very powerful, dynamic and challenging uh, teaching from God's word. I believe that all of us are really blessed and I would encourage all of us to again hear this when we upload this into the YouTube 
And on behalf of Tracy and on behalf of all of us, the participants, uh, I take this opportunity to thank uh, dear Reverend Dr. Chris Wright for your wonderful ministry with us this evening. God bless you. And uh, now we will officially close with a word of prayer. After that, uh, uh, I hope uh, Reverend Dr. Chris Wright is available with us some more time to interact with us uh, informally at any questions or any clarifications or comments. Uh, may, may I request uh, Mr. Matthew Varghese, uh, the former director of Tracy, to lead us in the closing prayer. Okay, shall we pray? Uh, Father, we praise you for this uh, uh, evening time which you have uh, helped us to uh, think about your concern. And Lord, we praise you for uh, helping us to listen uh, your concern in a fresh manner. We praise you for uh, uh, using uh, Dr. Chris to communicate this truth to us in a, more, in, a, in a clear term. Lord, we pray that you may uh, help us and also the church at large uh, to <clears throat> be aware of uh, your concern for the whole world uh, so that we will be uh, getting involved engaging as we have heard uh, in uh, and also participating with you in the reconciliation and redemption of the whole thing all whole, whole world lord we pray that you may uh, continue to give us this perspective that uh, uh, that that all of us all the members of the church may be actively involved in their respective places, where they, wherever they have called, that uh, uh, they will be a representative of uh, your transformative um, uh, uh, work in their respective field. Lord, Lord we pray that you may uh, revive the church, give us uh, this uh, perspective um, uh, clearly in the coming days too. Though many times we neglect it, Lord, we pray that you may continue to speak to us through your servants, that uh, uh, we may seriously take it and uh, help all the members of the church to think seriously about uh, uh, the work what we are doing as part of the ministry, as part of the, the gospel, as part of the redemption, the redemptive plan of you. Lord, we... <clears throat> Praise you for the contribution of uh, uh, Dr. John Stott in many of our lives and also the whole church. We praise you for the, the great contribution he has given to us. And, and we thank uh, uh, you uh, for his life once again, Lord. We praise you for, for those words, even now coming into our ears uh, uh, through him. Lord, we pray that you may help us to be true to those words uh, of him, that we may be able to be uh, true representative of, uh, of you here in this world, uh, <clears throat> bringing the world and the world uh, together, Lord. And also, Lord, we praise you for uh, um, um, the Lancome uh, uh, partners, the trust, uh, and all the all the contributions they're continuing uh, in the uh, in these days. And we commit uh, uh, Dr. Chris and the whole team into their hand. Lord, we pray that we may help uh, 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 the ministry of Langham uh, that uh, the the same ministry may continue in the coming days. Lord. Once again, we commit all of us and the church at large uh, that uh, uh, we may be. Uh, true to uh, your word and true to your call that we will be uh, doing the work which you have entrusted with us in this world sincerely and with a deeper commitment. We, th we thank you for this, this evening you have given to us to reflect uh, on your concerns once again. Come into each of us into their hand.
continue to strengthen us and help us to stand for you and for the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Matthew Varghese. And once again, welcome all of you to step back another 15, 20 minutes to yeah, thank you. interact with uh, Reverend Dr. It's a rare honor and privilege for us to meet and interact with him. So uh, here we are, and the time is up to you. I could uh, answer, if you like, the question by Paul Yap um, yes, yes. very quickly, I think. Um, that's there. Um, I could stay just for about you know five or six minutes more, but um, when he talks about pastors and practical that's suggestions it. how pastors can learn about the problems and struggles uh, of, uh, quote, full-time workers who are full-time within the church, I would sometimes want to ask, um, full-time doing what? <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the things that uh, John Stott experienced, now he, you see, in his early days as a, as a minister, as a pastor at All Souls Church, was a great Bible preacher. But someone once said to him that his preaching was very, very biblical, but not applied. He wasn't making it relevant to the people in the congregation who were, you know, all different professions, lawyers and doctors and teachers and this and that and the other. And so he resolved to find out what his people were thinking. So he got a group around him of uh, younger, younger men, particularly who were in various professional walks of life. And he asked them to meet with him monthly, and they would read together secular books, books from the, the non-Christian world about um, sometimes novels, sometimes uh, biographies, um, or they would go to the theater together and, and watch you know, movies or whatever about the culture they were living in. And he said, I want you to bring me into the modern world, help me to understand the world that you live in and the problems that you have and the issues you're facing. And it was out of that interaction with the people as congregation, because he said, I want to understand your world so that I can relate the biblical world to your world. Uh, and, and so it took intention. It took decisions. It took him to be willing to make that time uh, and to listen to what they had to teach him not just what he had to teach them. So I would urge pastors to do something like that, uh, to have some kind of a group of people who will help you to understand the world, to bring their problems to you, and then to say, how does the Bible address these? Uh, and and that, that's a good way to do it, a good way forward. So that's my answer to Paul Yap's question. Uh, there's a question from Rajesh, a uh, question or comment. Thank you so much, Dr. Chris. What a powerful message on Christian in public square. Sadly, many evangelicals do not interact or involve in the human affairs. Do not bother. Uh, do not bother. Just a minute. Oh, sorry. Bother to connect neighbors. Yes. I think that's just a comment from Rajesh. Uh, Isaac is just saying that he's sad. Sad that so many people in India don't bother. Uh, and, you know, that's not only India where that's true. There's many places where it is. Um, yeah. And then there's one from Vigila Isaac. Vigila. Okay. Oh. Can you ask directly? Uh, yeah, I had asked that question. I'm new to this group. Uh, I've been a medical doctor and I've served both in the mission field in Jharkhand and now we are in a place that's okay, not considered a mission field, but I consider it my mission field. My question is, you know, like I have a lot of friends, Christian doctors, believers who believe that, you know, they will uh, be a witness to Christ through their work. Uh, but they will, you know, uh, they feel they don't need to share the gospel. Um, I don't believe that. I believe that wherever there is an opportunity, um, I need to share the love of God um, and the uh, salvation through Christ to my patients. And God opens up ways. But I just want to know, like, how, how do we have a balance in that? from being, you know, too pushy and being too laid back in this, yeah, in, the, in, the, in the marketplace. 
Yeah, thank you, Vijay. That's a good question. And it is an issue, of course, that affects a lot of people. Um, and the way you put it is, is there a balance? And I'm sure there is. Um, I think the, you know, we are told by Jesus and by Paul and by Peter that we are to live in such a way that our lives raise questions uh, and raise, you know, people who ask about why we have a hope and, and what is what makes a difference in our lives. So as you put it, whenever the opportunities arise, then we should certainly be willing and eager to state what it is that drives us, that we believe there is good news. And it's because there is good news, the gospel, that we are doing what we're doing. We're doing it for Christ's sake. Uh, I just had a uh, email from some of uh, my friends in Ukraine at the moment uh, who are in a seminary there, which is actually being shelled, but they are still there. They're staying there and they've been trying to bring help to those who are in basements and they've been getting food and medications, helping people out and so on. And they say that in their email, they say that sometimes these people ask us, why are you staying to help us rather than getting mm -hmm. to safety yourselves? And when they tell them it's because they're Christians and they, they want to do that for Jesus sake, then uh, it enables them to have an opportunity to share the gospel and to talk about the evils of the world and, and so on. So whenever Christians reach out and do good, then there ought to be a response which provides an opportunity to, for the gospel. Um, so I, I can't, like you, I can't agree with those who feel that the only way we bear witness is by doing good work and we never need to actually share verbally the gospel. Mm. I think uh, if we believe in the centrality of the gospel and the centrality of the cross and resurrection of Christ, then that ought to govern what we do. Um, now, of course, in some contexts, uh, that's simply not possible. I mean, uh, in Britain, for example, if a Christian doctor or nurse mm -hmm shares their faith too overtly or too clearly in the medical public workplace they can get sacked because they're mm -hmm. accused of you know inflicting their beliefs on others and you mustn't do that so it, it does call for sensitivity and for carefulness and uh, and for a degree of wisdom so that uh, you do it in such a way that you don't end up uh, losing your job uh, but that you have that opportunity so thank you for the question Vigila. And perhaps there's time, Isaac, for just one or maybe two more, because I need to finish up. Within yeah, a that's a question from Cheryl Thomas. Uh, okay. what, what would be your message to gifted young Christians in countries like India who may choose the easier option of immigrating to more developed economies rather than serve with much difficulty and pain in developing contexts, especially in dealing with systemic in issues of injustice and social exclusion yes uh, that is a hard one and you know i i i want to be both you know serious but compassionate I, mean, I, I don't want to necessarily judge or criticize everybody who has ever chosen to leave uh, india or, or any other so-called majority world country to go to somewhere more economically uh, blessed or more physically safe um, and I, so i can understand that especially for people who've got families got married and want to move on I just feel that uh, people need to examine their hearts and their motivations very carefully if they're followers of Jesus. Uh, and of course, it's easy for me to sort of say this because I live here in Britain in fairly comfortable circumstances. So I, that's why I don't want to be a judge. Um, but I do, I do respect many of our Langham scholars, our Langham friends, people who, who have got the degrees, who have chosen to stay uh, or to return to their home country in India and often to live in very difficult, challenging circumstances, both physically and economically. So I think one has to listen carefully to the Lord Jesus and say, what do you want me to do? Am I prepared to go where you want me to go or to stay where you want me to stay uh, rather than choosing the easier option as it may seem? And let's also remember that, you know, there's that old saying that the grass is always greener on the other side of the street and some people emigrate uh, and they don't find great happiness or joy in the country where they go to and they experience racism uh, and all kinds of hatreds and things uh, and life is not necessarily all of a sudden much easier for them so uh, it needs to be weighed up very carefully uh, i think we would digress uh, we would uh, once again thank dr chris for being with us and even extending his time and he was available for us uh, as we all of us know He's a very, very busy person with a lot of demands, with a lot of ministry schedules. However, uh, he has set apart, uh, he could set apart this evening for us. And we are once again grateful to you. Uh, we convey our greetings to your family and to the Langham Partnership, the family of Langham Partnership. 
Yes. Once again, thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Chris Wright. Thank you, Isaac. And...